Hello guys and welcome to the channel. In this video I'm going to be building Tamiya's Tiger 1 and surprisingly this is the first Tiger tank I've built on this channel. I've built the Elephant before and I've built the Yag Tiger and the King Tiger but I haven't actually built a Tiger 1 yet. So as you can see this is Tamiya's early production Tiger kit and it comes with a good number of options and the ability to build six different tanks each of which has slight variations in terms of the equipment on the tank or the layout of the equipment. So let's look at the paint schemes first. We've got a standard all dark yellow Russian 1944 version. We've got a Russian 1943 version in overall dark grey. Another version in overall dark yellow which is Tiger 131. This is the Bovington Tank Museum Tiger. And of course we know now from further research that this is incorrect, it shouldn't be uh, overall dark yellow, it should have the uh, tropical desert scheme. Then we have a fairly standard German three colour camouflage scheme. One winter whitewash camo scheme. And a dark yellow and green scheme. So the instructions feature this rather handy little table which tell you what each of those tanks had. So you can see, for example, that uh, the spare tracks on the turret only appeared on three out of those six options there. Uh, whereas the other ones presumably had them either on the hull, or actually in one case of the Tiger 131, they didn't have any spare tracks at all, apparently. The version which I'm going for is version B here. So you can see it has the late production mantlet, it has the S mine, it doesn't have the Lotus Periscope or the spare tracks on the turret, it does have the spare tracks on the front of the hull. It doesn't have the late production sprocket and it has the late production air pre-cleaner. So it's quite a handy little table for Tamiya to include. And it's nice to see different options for equipment rather than just for paint schemes. And straight away in the first part of the instructions you can see where that becomes relevant. We have either the early or the late production sprockets um, depending on the version of building. So as you would expect for a Tamiya kit, the instructions are easy to follow and the assembly was pretty smooth. One thing I did notice when I was attaching the suspension arms here, there is a little pin to guide their placement, they're not workable. However, it is possible, by coincidence, to put the suspension arms in backwards and still have them line up with the pin. And the only way you would notice you've done this is when you get to the one at the end and there's no pin to guide it so you know you've got it in the wrong way. Most of the upper deck is a single piece, you can see here all of those grills and hatches which might be separate pieces on other kits like Dragon or Tacom are all there already. It's only that central engine cover which is separate. As this is the early production of the Tiger, it does have the insane number of road wheels. I believe on later versions the outer set of wheels were removed. The gun barrel is in two halves, so you will need to deal with the seam lines, but it's not a major problem. And enough of the gun breech is included that you can see some of it through the hatches should you decide to leave them open. And that just stops it looking like an empty black box inside.
As you would expect, the tools and their clamps are all one piece. There's no fiddling around here with tiny photo etch or similar. And before I close things up by gluing on the top piece, I just gave the inside a paint of flat black. This is the cheapest artist acrylic paint I could find. And this is just to stop the kit looking like an obvious empty box when you look through the open commander's hatch. The air pre-filter assembly is interesting. It has these strange uh, braided pipes which you have to cut to length. Unfortunately those pipes do fray quite easily at the end. But they look good when they're in place. The side skirts are in one long piece and it's quite common on models like this to leave a side skirt off or to bend them a little bit. So I cut out a middle section and then I sanded these as thin as I could get them to make them look a little bit more realistic in terms of their width. And I used a pair of pliers just to tweak the edges and the corners in particular to make them look a little bit less straight and even. And here is the kit before painting. I haven't glued everything in place yet, so the turret is still separate of course, and even the roof of the turret is separate too. The tow cables on the side have to be left off because the decals for the German markings go below them. The instructions do point that out for you. And I gave the inside of the turret and the gun breach a coat of ivory, which is the standard German interior colour. And then everything got a coat of NATO black, and then of XF63 German grey. I painted the rusted exhaust with my usual three Vallejo colours. I did this before I did the camo scheme because I have to paint the exhaust and then put the exhaust guards on, and then the camo scheme goes over the top of those. The decals went on easily, there's a little bit of silvering there which is entirely my own fault. So here is the tank in the German grey base coat with the decals. And the next step was to add the winter camouflage. I didn't really want to do the standard hairspray chipping technique. I wanted to do something a little bit different and I quite like the uh, splinter camo schemes. So I did consider using this uh, winter camouflage paint from Precision Ice and Snow. It's really good, I've used it before, but it's probably not the right tool for the job in this case. So instead I went for some good old uh, Tamiya white acrylic paint. Unfortunately at the moment I don't have any flat white, and I can't find any in any of the shops that I use, so unfortunately I'm going to put some gloss down and then try to dull it down with a matte coat. And although having the white as a splinter scheme and looking like it is uh, part of the factory applied paint might not be super realistic, it's something I wanted to try. So I masked off the areas of grey using 10mm Tamiya tape. This is the result of the masking. And this is the result of applying the white paint. I've tried to apply the white paint lightly so that it looks a little bit warm. And it looks quite stark at the moment, but I think the weathering will tone that down and I'm quite happy with the way that's turned out. Before I moved on to the weathering, I added some chipping to the tow cables. This is Tamiya XF53 metallic grey. And when painting the tools I use the technique of sliding some paper under them to avoid getting paint on the body of the tank. On tools like the hammer, I only added chips of metallic paint rather than painting the head all in one colour.
For the first stage of weathering I used this streaking grime for DAC vehicles. That might seem like an odd choice given that snow camouflage is about as far removed from Africa as you can imagine. But I do like the colour of this, it's a very sort of grey green colour which looks quite like um, sort of murky dirty water and I want to eventually have this tank coming out of a uh, frozen or half frozen river. So it's quite a nice choice I think for that. For the wheels I applied it a lot more heavily as these would have obviously been submerged as it comes out of the water. And that kind of filters and breaks up the colour of the white there. I'm not a huge fan of chipping techniques but I did add a little bit of chipping to certain edges here. This is a lightened version of German Grey. And you can see here in the background that nice dirty grimy effect which the streaking grime has left. I then added another oil pin wash to certain areas of the tank. This is burnt umber. I'm applying this a lot more lightly than the streaking grime and not in all areas. As is standard with the older Tamiya kits, the tracks are the rubber band type. These can be glued together with normal modelling cement. And here I'm simulating the wear on the tracks with a metallic coloured paint. It looks quite stark at the moment but it will be toned down later on. And the same thing on the track surfaces where they've been in contact with the road. I recently got hold of these Abtai Lung 502 oil paints and they're really fantastic paints. I still have some artist oil paints but these ones are much better in terms of control and flow. The first step was to put a few dots of the oil paint around certain details and then blend them in with a dry brush to simulate dirt and grime on the surface, almost blending them away. I went a lot more heavily here around the turret ring. This kind of simulates dirt and grease around the turret. And of course a lot of that gets hidden once the turret goes in place. And I repeated the effect on a smaller scale in other areas, especially the engine deck. I particularly like the effect here on the wheels where it looks a little bit like grease. 
This is the industrial earth oil paint. And I did add a few dots of the darker brown paint as well. The second oil paint technique I used was the dots to represent streaking. You can see here I've added some small dots on the side of the turret of white and brown and tan oil paint. And as you blend those in a vertical motion with a dry brush, it gives the effect of streaks. In the initial stages it does look horrible, but you have to remember that you can blend them to they're virtually invisible. And of course, if you feel like you've made a big mistake, you can always use some thinners to remove the paints completely. And here is a good example of that on the front plate where I've clearly added far too much brown oil paint there. And I just clean it up a little bit with some thinners and reduce it. On the camera some of these streaks have virtually disappeared but they are visible still on the model. And there we go, that has toned down that stark uh, splinter camouflage pattern quite well I think. And I'm starting to like the way this is looking now. So one of the things I noticed when I looked at some reference images was these tigers on the Russian front with some barbed wire around them. And this was presumably to discourage enemy infantry from climbing on the tank. I've had some photo etched barbed wire for quite a long time now so I thought this would be a good opportunity to use it. And then I attached it to the side of the tank trying to make it look a little bit like it was around some natural fittings. And because it's photo etched I had to use some super glue to attach it. It was quite fiddly so I didn't show the process but this is the end result. You can see the paint has flaked off the metal in a couple of areas and it will need some touching up. The great thing about gluing it underneath the side skirts is that it doesn't really matter if you put a big blob of super glue there because it won't be visible. And the final weathering I wanted to do was some mud effects using some pigments. We have a dark brown, a slightly lighter brown and then the asphalt is a very dark grey brown. And that's the one I started with. Initially I mixed the pigment with some thinner and I put it into the space. I dabbed it on with an old brush in the space behind the wheels, most of which won't be seen later on anyway. And I did the same in the bottom of the tank. This is a hard edge at the moment but it will be blended with the splatter effects. To make the splatter effects I dipped the brush in the pigment thinner mix. And then I flick the brush against a cocktail stick from the front of the vehicle so the splash is going backwards. With this initial layer I went really thick. You can control the size of the splashes by the amount of thinner in the mixture and by the amount of mixture that you put on the paintbrush. And this is the first layer once it's dried. You can see that that hard edge at the back there is starting to blend in a little bit. And at this point I attach the tracks. I didn't want to do that later because I didn't want to damage the pigments. Perhaps I should have attached them before I even put the initial pigments on. Because these tracks are rubber they lack the weight of the real tracks. So I had to super glue them to the top of the road wheels to get that sagging effect. I use some of the pigment thinner mixture inside the recesses on the tracks. And then for some reason I didn't film it, but I repeated the mud splatter effects with the other two pigment colours to give some variation. And for those second two colours I went much lighter compared to the base layer. And with that done the model was complete. Before I show you the final results let me take a moment to say thank you to my Patreon supporters. 
I really do appreciate all of your support guys and all income I get from that does of course go back into buying things for the channel. So thanks a lot guys, I really appreciate that. And before we go, let's take a quick sneak preview at a couple of upcoming videos that I've got. I always tend to have about five or six models in various stages of building, painting or weathering. So these kits might not turn up immediately, but they will turn up eventually on the channel. So guys, as always, thank you very much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed that video. I had a lot of fun building that kit. I do have plans to put it inside a small diorama in the future. Although I'm aware that I say that for a lot of models and I don't often get around to it but it is on the big long list of things to do. So until next time guys, thank you very much for watching.